Everybody and welcome to the secret of the golden flower. <laughs> I know I said I was done, but then I got some interesting questions. So I want to address them. The first question is, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a real question or if somebody is just messing with me. But either way, I'm going to answer it. Let's go through each question, uh, each word in the question. Meaning. Meaning is not necessary for life. If you ask the birds or the trees or the buffaloes, or the cows, what is the meaning of life? They just look at you. <laughs> life is the meaning of life. Meaning is something artificial, something fabricated. It's not intrinsic. It's not essential. It's something that we add that we superimpose something that we make up actually it's more or less arbitrary so humans make meaning by putting things in context we've been over this many many times in these series that meaning is derived from context the relation of the part with the whole. So, the interesting thing is, what is human being? Human being is a microcosm. Human being has the same design as the whole, but simply an atomic part. So, one way to look at the meaning of existence is that human beings are the meaning of existence. We are, as far as we know anyway, the only beings who even have such a thing as meaning, such a concept, such a construct. So, when we ask what is the meaning of life, it means something that we impose on life, something that we make up and we use to justify our actions and attitudes. Meaning. Meaning is something expressed in symbols, words. And that means it's abstract. It's an abstraction. An abstraction is a picture of something, a symbol for something where we take a bunch of information and we simplify it so that it's easier to handle. It's a lot easier to talk about words than it is to deal with reality. So people prefer words. People prefer meaning over the actuality. And of course, the meaning is different from the thing that it represents. The map is different from the territory. No conclusion reached by reasoning can be accurate or reliable because reasoning is about symbols and we're trying to come to conclusions about the reality without checking with reality to see if they're true. And when we do, we always find out they're wrong. Because, why? 
any context that we create to give meaning to a symbol is a definition. And a definition is a limit, a boundary, a partial thing. We're taking reality and slicing it into pieces, making boundaries where there are no boundaries. In actual life, there's no clear-cut boundaries, for example, between different countries. We give that meaning to nature, but nature doesn't have that meaning intrinsically. So meaning is something that we fabricate, that we synthesize, that we apply and designate, that we define by limits, by boundaries, yet it's completely artificial. Meaning is not something that is part of the reality. Right? If you really want to know the meaning of the existence, the meaning is the existence itself. Any other meaning is simply an abstraction. It's simply our opinion. It's not something real. The Buddha would call it adhamma, meaning it's not an actual arising, it's simply a thought. So we shouldn't take our meaning too seriously. Yes, sometimes meanings can help if we create them consciously, if we build them, if we build an ontology or a taxonomy, it can help us sometimes to simulate things, to understand things that we ordinarily would not be able to. It may allow us to perceive things that we can't normally perceive. But thereby is the danger that we may perceive something completely artificial, completely synthetic, completely made up. So, to understand the meaning of reality, one would have to know the reality as a complete whole. And nobody can do that. Our consciousness, our awareness is limited. So when someone asks, what is the meaning of life, either they're teasing, or they're really, really an illusion, huh? they're expecting an answer that will resolve their problems. And what are their problems? Their problems are because of meaning. You see, as soon as you say, as soon as you define, as soon as you uh, give a meaning to something, you limit it. If I say, I am a man, that means I'm not a woman. As soon as you say, I am an American, that means I'm not from any other country, and so on. So you have to divide the existence up into pieces, you know, which in actuality it's not. Actually, everyone is to some degree masculine and to some degree feminine. And they fall somewhere on a spectrum. Huh? Actually, everyone is from this planet, Earth. And there's no really such thing as countries. All these things are abstractions. Countries, corporations, religions, philosophies. They're just words, symbols. So, if you want to know what is the meaning of life, the meaning is life itself. What is the meaning of the universe? The meaning is the universe itself. It can't be divided. If you divide it, you kill it. If you say, like, what is the meaning of your arm? And you, you cut the arm off from the body, <laughs> the arm becomes useless. It's dead. Only the whole has the meaning. Only the whole has the, all of the information. And that can't be divided. So it's not fair to say that there is no meaning. 
Yes, there is. But that meaning is so vast, so deep, so detailed, that we can't really comprehend it. So we just have to accept it for what it is. And that's the beauty of life. Now, the second question. I love this one. You and your Guru Osho are Maya bodies. So, for those of you with, uh, without a certain background, I have to explain the question before I give the answer. Maya body means an impersonalist philosopher. There is a, a branch of uh, Hinduism called uh, Shankarite. And the Shankarites believe in this philosophy of monism. Monism basically means it's all one. There are no boundaries. There are no limits. There are no definitions. Well, isn't that what I was just talking about? No. No. Because there are some natural boundaries. I am not you. That's a boundary. But I'm not going to define what I am. I'm not going to say artificially that I am you. Because obviously I'm not. So this uh, Shankarite philosophy, Mayavadi philosophy, Mayavadi is a pejorative. It's uh, used by the Vaishnavas, the uh, personalists, those who believe in the personal existence of God, uh, to uh, disrespect other philosophers who think that God is not a person. So it's a very, very broad sobriquet. Uh, it's actually an insult in the social context of Vaishnavism. So let's go back to the question. You and your guru, Osho, are my bodies. First of all, he's not my guru. He isn't even a guru. What to speak of my guru? So many times people approached Osho as a guru. And he would accept them. But later on he would clarify, actually, I'm your friend. Because a guru, the, the connotation of the word, is someone who is heavy. Someone who has a lot of knowledge. And Osho said, accumulating knowledge is useless because all knowledge is false. All knowledge is simply symbolic, simply words. And here we go again. Words can't really express the meaning of existence. So anyone who is giving knowledge in words and also has authority, being able to tell people what to do and they have to do it, is a guru. But Osho was never like that. Certainly he helped a lot of people, including myself, to attain self-realization. But his role was more like a friend. His role was more like encouraging and advising rather than a guru. He never conceived himself in that role of being a controller, being a boss. Uh, yes, he did advise his followers, for example, how to set up the commune, how to uh, do so many things and help in their spiritual lives. But he never insisted on this authority. He never um, punished people, for example, uh, if they would if they disobeyed him, <laughs> if they didn't accept his advice. He would never even frame the question in that kind of words. So, first of all, Osho is not a guru. And second of all, he's not my guru. I've had a lot of teachers in my life. Um, it would even be hard to sit down and list them because I have studied so many different teachers 
and learned their methods and applied them in my life. I can't say there's anyone who has been my guru. <laughs> Although I did take formal diksha from a few of them. It wasn't, from my side, it was not like a lifetime commitment where I gave up my existence to this person. It was a commitment to learn something, a commitment to understand something and apply it in my life. So I don't consider myself a disciple of anybody. I mean, if I were to consider myself like that, then I would have to say the closest one would be Osho because he helped me the most. He set me on the right path that actually led to self-realization. Now, what kind of self-realization? <laughs> well, the Vaishnavas have it all wrong. They think that Buddha, for example, is a Mayavadi, an impersonalist, because he denied the existence of God. No, not really. The Buddha accepted the existence of superhuman beings. There are many, many sutras where the Buddha talks about and even talks with superhuman beings, heavenly entities. So far from denying their existence, the Buddha even taught them. He even helped them attain enlightenment. <laughs> so how can he be an impersonalist? How can he say that there is no personal God? Rather, he accepted that there are many godly beings, superhuman beings. And he talked about pure lands, which are realms presided over by other Buddhas, other self-realized beings. So the Buddha isn't a Mayavadi. He's not a monist. In fact, the Buddha strenuously denied monism and dualism, and so do I. I don't think there is such a thing as monism, all one, oneness. It can't be proven because there are so many boundaries, so many differences. Huh? My right hand is different from my left hand. They're different. There's a boundary. Try to understand. If that boundary exists, if it's real, then there, it can't be all one, can it? No. In some ways, everything is connected. Yes, that's true. But in other ways, everything is different. <laughs> you can't come to a final conclusion, a neat little package that you can sew up and and that's it. That's the truth. Not possible. Existence is so complex, so varied, and so deep, we can't know everything. And it's an illusion to say that, oh, it's all one, or oh, it's all du dualistic. So dualism is also wrong. Monism is also wrong. In fact, what is usually called monism means Brahman, realization of the spiritual light. But Brahman, if you can see Brahman, if you can realize Brahman, that means Brahman is different from you. So how is it all one? Yet, Brahman is the root substance of everything. So how can it be two? <laughs> You see, as soon as we try to apply these words and concepts to existence, the whole thing falls apart. So really, existence is inconceivable, inexpressible, and living. Yes, there is a whole. We can say the whole existence, all of manifestation, everything that is, is. And everything that ain't, ain't. <laughs> but to try to 
wrap that all up in a neat little package just can't be done. So Osho isn't my guru, and we're not Mayavadis because we don't believe in monism. But we're not devotees or uh, theists either because we don't think there's one personal entity in charge of everything. Yes, there is one entity, which is the supreme whole which is the sum total of everything that exists. But you can't say that that is a person. Just look at the world. It's so complex. There's so many different parts. And nobody can explain. Actually, nobody can explain anything. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's a miracle that I'm sitting here talking to you. It's a miracle, that tree over there, huh? this wall behind me. It's all inexplicable. The scientists claim to be able to explain certain things. Huh? But then there's many, many other things they can't explain. And if we look deeply into how they explain, they explain by narrowing the context to where it's so narrow that they can create some kind of semantic system that can more or less predict what's going to happen. But in actuality, it can't predict. There are always boundaries, always limits to their knowledge. So the very concept of the question is wrong. So how can it have any answer? You see, you really have to think before you ask me a question. <laughs> Just like people are always asking how. You know, I say, well, you have to, you have to reverse the flow in the third eye, in the Agnya Chakra. And people say, how? Well, I can give different methods. Oh, here's a method I wanted to give and forgot during the series. Our eyes have lids on the outside. When we close them, it cuts off the light. Huh? But when, when they're open, so much light is coming in, huh? especially if we reverse the flow. So what if you close your eyes and imagine that they have lids on the inside? Huh? So you, you can open the outside and you can also open the inside. So imagine that you open the lids of your eyes on the inside when they're closed on the outside. And all the light that has come into them during the day or whatever then comes out. Boom, you have reversed the flow. This is a very powerful method which I discovered quite by accident. And it works. In fact, that's how I go to sleep at night. <laughs> I close my eyes, I open them on the inside, and let all the light come out. And what happens? Reverse the flow. And I just watch the beautiful light. <laughs>